What is the hydrogen economy? Why do so many people say it's impossible? And why is it going to happen anyway? Keep watching to find out. Now, before we start, I have to explain a couple of things. First of all, I'm not paid directly or indirectly by any of the energy solutions I'm discussing in this video, which means, yes, there is going to be some controversy. Now, in this video, we are going to be discussing a lot of problems. So I want to start by putting them into three categories. And the first category are what I call fundamental problems. They are basic to how our universe works. So, for example, we can't just get energy from nowhere. The next category is made of what I call science problems. In other words, we're sure that these things should be possible, but we just don't have enough science to know how to do it. And the final category are what I call engineering problems. In other words, we have all the science that we need, we have all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, we just need to work out how to put them together. It doesn't mean that that's easy, but we absolutely can find a solution if we work hard enough. So why are people talking about hydrogen? Well, as you should know, we are heating the planet to death by burning fossil fuels and emitting greenhouse gases. It's happening now and it's constantly accelerating. Now, this is nothing new. Scientists have been warning the world about greenhouse effects for over 60 years. But what is new is that some governments have started to take things a bit seriously. And that means they've begun to take baby steps to get us off of our fossil fuel addiction. So, great. At last, we can build lots of solar panels, make lots of wind farms, and power everything with renewable energy. And the sun is up there somewhere. Ah, yes, there's a problem. You see, renewable energy sources have one or both of two fundamental problems. The first problem is that they aren't working all of the time, which makes them unreliable. And the second problem means that they can only supply energy to their local area. So if you've put a load of solar panels in the desert, that's great, but only people that live near that desert get to use the energy. Long range, direct transmission of electricity is very much on the border between a science and an engineering problem. And all of that means that yes, there will be some sunny, windy days where we have enough renewable energy for everybody, but there will always be windless nights where we're getting nothing. So the obvious solution is to store up the energy from those lovely sunny windy days and keep it for when we don't have enough. And there are many solutions for that. Batteries are the obvious one, but there are also water pumps that pump water uphill so that we can let it run down through generators later. And there's even giant solar farms that melt salt and store the energy that way. Well, I'm glad that's sorted then. Ah, yes, well, they all have problems. Batteries are mobile, but they're actually not very big. And we would need a lot of materials mined for the huge amounts of energy we want to store. And they degrade over time. As for water and molten salt, yep, they're fine, but they are local. They will only work for areas near those solutions. I'm not saying that these things won't work at all, and I'm not saying that we aren't going to use them to some extent, but I am saying that they aren't global in scale. So now we get to hydrogen. The idea is that we use our renewable energy to make hydrogen, and then later, when we need the energy back, we use that hydrogen either directly for heating or to get electricity using something called a hydrogen fuel cell. 
and hydrogen is mobile. You just stick it in some big tanks and ship it around the world. Now we can understand why people talk about a hydrogen economy, but not a solar or a wind economy. It's because we can make our hydrogen, we can store it, we can buy it and we can sell it right around the world. Everyone's arguing about hydrogen versus batteries for cars, but that's really a very minor problem. The real advantage of hydrogen is its potential scale. It could be used to power national energy grids or as backup for small towns or for fueling entire fleets of trucks. We used to have enormous gas storage tanks for natural gas around all of our cities in the UK as an energy storage option for local power. And we can do the same thing for hydrogen. It'll be harder, but it's definitely possible. So hydrogen isn't a competitor for batteries. It's a complement. Hurrah, I'm glad that's all sorted then. Ah, but there are problems. So why aren't we just doing that then? Well, we are but we're doing it on a very small scale. We already have hydrogen-powered cars, buses, trains, and even space stations. But why aren't we doing it on a global scale? Well, it turns out that producing, storing, and using hydrogen has several problems. Let's start with the production of hydrogen. There are easy ways to make it, and there are difficult ways to make it. The easy way to make hydrogen is to take a fossil fuel and run super hot steam over it in a process called steam reformation. The problem with this process is that it produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct, the very gas that we are trying to take out of the atmosphere. Now, it is easier to capture that carbon dioxide that we produce, but that makes the hydrogen more expensive. And if we are using fossil fuels to heat the steam in the first place, then that carbon dioxide is definitely hard to capture. Now, the dream, of course, is to use our renewable electricity to generate our hydrogen directly by a process called electrolysis. That way, we're not producing any carbon dioxide and we're getting a hydrogen directly. The problem with that process, however, is that it's very inefficient if we just use normal materials as the electrodes. Those are the big plates that stick into the water and conduct the electricity. The fundamental problem here is that we are trying to break up water which is a material that has very poor electrical conductivity. And that process is a multi-step process that produces all kinds of intermediate chemicals that would all just much rather go back to being water. And then on top of that, when we do get our hydrogen and oxygen, they come in the form of bubbles, which pushes away our water mixture and reduces the area of the electrodes which are available for working. But even that wouldn't be much of a problem if the electrodes were cheap, but they're not. To make the process even reasonably efficient, we have to use extremely expensive metals like platinum and iridium. Have you even heard of iridium? Now, things are much easier if we heat up the water, but that heating requires energy, which makes our process less efficient overall. Then, when we want to use our hydrogen to generate electricity again, we get all the same problems, but in reverse. So we still need those really expensive metals. On top of that, hydrogen is, of course, explosive, so we have to store it in strong containers. But even that's a problem because hydrogen is a very small molecule and it's very reactive. So it can get right into even metal crystals and start corroding them from the inside. 
So, given all these problems, why is the hydrogen economy actually inevitable? Let's start by putting all of these problems in context and let's start with the easiest one. Any arguments that point out that hydrogen is less convenient or more expensive than fossil fuels count for nothing. Nothing. Fossil fuels are a store of hundreds of millions of years of solar power. They are highly concentrated, they are relatively easy to process and transport, and nothing is going to compete with them in terms of price and convenience. So whatever solution we use, it's going to be more expensive and it is going to be less convenient than fossil fuels. But we know that fossil fuels are extremely polluting and toxic and we know that they're killing our planet with greenhouse gases. That's if the wars over water and food that come directly from climate change don't kill us first. So we simply don't have any other option but to abandon fossil fuels for something more expensive and less convenient as soon as possible. But there's nothing unusual about paying money for a better environment, is there? If you want blue skies and clean air, then you have to stop pollution. And that costs money. Living in clean cities always costs more than living in dirty ones. And the people living in those clean cities pay that price because a better environment leads to a better quality of life and better economies. Spending money on stopping pollution is a necessary investment, not a waste. So the next question is, is a hydrogen economy even possible? And the answer to that is that it absolutely is. We just don't know how to get all of the pieces of the puzzle together yet. In other words, we have a large number of engineering problems. So let's break them down and see how we're doing. Hydrogen from fossil fuels is certainly not good, but it does have the advantage that we can get lots of hydrogen now to support the infrastructure as we are building it. As for electrolyzing water, the benchmark seems to be about 10% efficiency in terms of electrical power to hydrogen generation. Now that doesn't sound good, but at the beginning of this century, solar panels were only generating about 10% solar to electricity efficiency. And I remember almost everybody saying that they would never compete with fossil fuel. So is water splitting going through a similar process of improvement? And the answer is yes, it is. In fact, in between researching this video and actually making it, I found an article that was announcing a potential 20% efficiency in terms of solar power to hydrogen generation. And we also have new catalysts that have greatly reduced precious metals, catalysts that have no precious metals, catalysts that are extremely robust, catalysts that split water directly from sunlight, and catalysts that split seawater directly from sunlight. So why aren't there industrial water splitting plants scattered around the world? Well, there are, but they're still very small scale. And that's because we don't yet have a catalyst which combines all of the properties of our latest advances. Now, the next challenge is transporting hydrogen. And that is still a challenge at industrial scales, but there are many promising technologies on the way. For small scale, compressed gas tanks are certainly the best, and we certainly have them deployed in cars and buses already, but they are expensive at the moment. On the other hand, that cost and that expense will come down greatly once production scales up. But for that, we need more people using more cars and more buses. For long distance transport over sea, liquid hydrogen appears to be 
the best choice. And in fact, Kawasaki Industries have already made a prototype boat fitted out for transporting liquid hydrogen. For long-term storage or transport, something called a hydrogen chemical transporter looks very interesting. In this case, hydrogen is reacted with something else to make a third chemical. Now, this third chemical is much less dangerous, much less corrosive than hydrogen. It can be shipped or even piped around quite easily. And then at the other end, it can either be used directly by something called a solid oxide fuel cell to produce energy, or the reaction can be reversed and the hydrogen can be taken back out again and put into gas tanks or whatever. Finally, there are the catalysts that help to generate electricity from the hydrogen gas, and those too are going through an acceleration of development in a similar way to the water splitting catalysts. So you can see that there is so much research being done and so much scope for development. In fact, research into hydrogen power is growing exponentially. But there is one more technology that will change everything. Before we go on though, if you click the like button, it'll really help out the channel. Thanks. The technology that will change everything is already very well developed. It's nuclear power. Compared to fossil fuels, nuclear power is safe with very low levels of environmental pollution. The reason we don't have more nuclear power is not because of the Chernobyl and Fukushima accidents. It's because of so-called environmental groups that have an ideological opposition to nuclear power. And they've been so good at spreading messages of fear to people that they have directly caused a huge negative impact to the environment and our health. I said before that many of the technologies that could make the hydrogen economy a reality need a source of heat. And nuclear power stations are constantly generating huge amounts of heat as waste as they generate electricity, and they are generating electricity 24 hours a day, every day. And that means that we could be using nuclear power as a backup for our renewable energy sources. It could be providing electricity when we have a windless night, and then on our sunny, windy days, that nuclear power together with the heat can be used to split water up to produce hydrogen so that we can store energy as hydrogen for when we want to use it later. That means that hydrogen power would be part of an energy mix. We would have our renewable sources, which are unreliable, but very low polluting. We would have our nuclear power, which is always on and usually wasteful. But then we can catch that wasted energy by storing it as hydrogen and then shipping it around the world wherever it is needed. So let's put all of this together. Despite clear warnings from scientists that we need to stop using fossil fuels, there hasn't been much commercial incentive to develop alternative technologies such as hydrogen power. But when we do have that incentive, things can change quickly, very quickly. A few years ago, when the rich and powerful decided they wanted a COVID vaccine, they got one. And they got it in one year when many people thought it would be impossible and when many more people thought it would take at least 10 years. The same thing will happen with the climate crisis eventually. The rich and powerful will finally understand that it's coming for them just like for everybody else, and they'll also realize that they will have to invest in green technologies. A true hydrogen economy as part of an energy mix would allow a cheap, abundant supply of relatively clean energy that can be bought and sold. And that means that people will get rich and that's when we'll get the investment that we need to make the hydrogen economy a reality. 
It's already started, it's just developing too slowly. But it is inevitable because of the climate crisis and because of economics. So, do you have any questions about the hydrogen economy? Or what do you think the future of energy will look like? Just let me know down there in the comments. And if you're interested in digging in a little deeper into the controversies around nuclear power, just check out my previous video. See you next time. So things like wormholes for instate... Oh, I can never say that. Interstellar, interstellar travel, interstellar travel, interstellar travel, instaste, insta wormholes, for example, for interstellar travel, or I've forgotten the other one now. Oh.